This is the BBC. Hello and welcome to a shiny new series of analysis, the series which tries to understand the ideas behind the news. If you haven't yet subscribed to our podcast feed, well, what are you waiting for? I'm the editor, Hugh Levinson, and a little while ago I was talking to the journalist Marianne Seacart. She was starting work on a book about bias against women. I asked her what she thought was the most surprising aspect of her research, and this programme is based on her reply. I hope you enjoy it. I've been a feminist all my life because I get infuriated by how often men are biased against women. Yet even I probably have an unconscious bias against other women too. Are you surprised by that? Well, I certainly am. And that's what this programme is going to be all about. Women's own bias. How does it show itself? Where does it come from? And what can we do about it? It's not just me. Hollywood actor Anne Hathaway recently admitted to implicit sexist bias when she was working on the film One Day, directed by Lona Scherfig. I really regret not trusting her more easily. And I am to this day scared that the reason I didn't trust her the way I trust some of the other directors I've worked with is because she's a woman. She was speaking on ABC's Popcorn with Peter Travis show. I'm so scared that I treated her with internalised misogyny. When I see a, a film, a first film directed by a woman, I have in the past focused on what was wrong with it. And when I see a, a film directed, first time directed by a man, I focus on what's right with it. I wonder whether some literary agents who are disproportionately female might be doing the same thing, focusing on what's wrong with a woman's work rather than what's right with it. That could explain what happened to Catherine Nichols, a writer based in Boston. I was looking for a literary agent, and the way that's done is you put together a letter that describes your book and the first few pages, and friends who were themselves accomplished writers were saying, this is good to go, this is good work. And I only got two responses from agents asking to see the entire manuscript. And how many initial letters did you send? Fifty. So two out of fifty uh, um, wanted to see the manuscript. It was really <laughs> depressing, yeah. It I was, bet. <laughs> it was very dispiriting. And that wasn't even wanting to represent me, that was even wanting to see the manuscript at all. And I just felt like I had run into a wall, like I had nothing to lose by just trying this kind, of, <laughs> this kind of nutty plan to just try it under a different name. So she chose a male name and submitted exactly the same novel again as a man. And remember, most of the agents she sent it to were women. I'd use the same letter, the same description of the novel, the same opening pages. And even within hours of sending out those letters through email, I was getting manuscript requests. It was shocking how fast it became obvious that there was a big difference. So did you send 50 of these letters out under the male name? I did, yeah. And how many people said they wanted to see the manuscript when you had a male name? 17. So 17 compared uh, to two, which suggests that you were eight and a half times better writer <laughs> under a male name than a female name. <laughs> yeah, I was shocked. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not surprised. What about sort of critical reactions? That was where I went from feeling flattered to feeling angry. As a man, I felt like the critical responses, they'd get into the structure of the book or the thought processes of the characters, the mechanics of how the plot is controlled or explodes, and all of that felt like it was making me a better writer. So what this suggests is that young male aspiring writers get far more help, don't they? Not only do they get more interest in the first place, but they also get more coaching and more encouragement. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Did it give you an insight into what it must feel like to be a man? My strong sense is it must feel amazing to be, <laughs> to be a man. <laughs> You might be thinking this is just one woman's story. It's anecdotal. But there's scientific evidence of women's gender bias too. 
In one experiment, researchers sent out identical application forms for a lab manager position to male and female science professors. The CVs were exactly the same, but half had a male name and the other half a female. The study was co-authored by Professor John DeVidio of Yale University. We looked at their interest in terms of hiring the person, their perceptions of competence of the person, and things like how much money they would pay the person if they hired them for the job as a lab manager. And what was the result? The result was that gender bias still exists, and professors in the sciences were more likely to see the male as more hireable than the female. They were more likely to see the male as more competent than the female, and they were also more likely to pay the male lab manager more money, even though their CVs were identical. Did you not ask also whether this professor would be interested in mentoring the candidate? Yes, we also looked at mentoring, and mentoring as well differed. And were these differences statistically significant? They were all statistically significant, and the gender of the professor who received the CVs didn't make a difference. The bias was of the same magnitude, whether the professor was a woman or a man. So you've got not just men being biased against women and not promoting them in science, but also other women. And that tends to perpetuate it even more because we've done some other research with respect to race, but if you have people making a joint decision and a member of the minority group goes along with members of the majority group who have these subtle biases, it legitimatizes the response where you're going to continue to hire the man more than the woman. So in fact, when women exhibit this subtle bias, it actually frees up men to express the subtle bias more. Women tend to conform to that expectation, and you tend to exacerbate or perpetuate the bias. Scientific experiments can only test a small number of people. But you find indicators of women's own bias in bigger groups too, in the real world. Look at Twitter. My name's Adam Parker. I'm the founder of Listed. Listed is a software application that looks at who's influential on social media. Adam did a survey of who were the most influential British political journalists on Twitter during the recent general election campaign. How many times were their tweets liked or retweeted in other words, spread around the Twitter network, specifically by influencers who are people with lots of Twitter followers. To his surprise, he found that not a single woman made it into the top ten. Not even the most powerful political journalist in the country, the BBC's political editor, Laura Koonsberg. So you looked at these influencers and you asked, are they following and retweeting male political journalists more than female political journalists? Absolutely. So what we found was the male group as a whole was retweeted and liked nearly five times, 4.9 times more than the female group by Twitter users generally, and 4.3 times more by the influencers specifically. And once you corrected for the fact that there are more men, that they're a bit more opinionated, that they tweet a bit more often, what did you find in the end? Yes, you find about half and half. About half of the disparity is explained by the factors you've just mentioned. The other half was accounted for by that following and retweeting behaviour. In both cases, we also found that that apparent bias that was being displayed was actually displayed by the majority of both male and female influencers. Though it was more pronounced in the male group, it still existed in the female group. So women are following female political journalists less than male political journalists and then retweeting them less? Yes. As a whole, obviously it does vary, but as a group, yes. I did actually ask you to measure my behaviour and I promised to publish it however bad it was and luckily it turned out that I was exactly 50-50. Yeah, having adjusted for demographics and that yours was bang on 50-50. Well, that's a relief. It's easy to detect your Twitter bias, just have a look at who you follow and retweet. But it's much harder to spot your wider bias because it's largely unconscious, otherwise known as implicit. Unless we know the bias is there in the first place, it's hard to correct for it in our conscious actions, particularly as our unconscious brain has hugely more processing power than our conscious brain. So it's essentially in charge of most of our day-to-day functioning, including very complex social processes. Tinu Cornish is a chartered occupational psychologist at the Equality Challenge Unit. 
there's a process called categorization, where when we see someone approaching, we have to work out what we can expect from them, whether they're going to be a friend or a foe, how we're going to respond to them. And so our unconscious brain instantly categorizes people into, are they like me? Are they in a high status group? Or are they not like me? Or are they in a low status group? And then they associate positive characteristics towards people who are like us or who are high status, negative characteristics towards people who are not like us. Then comes an association of emotion, warmth towards people who are like us, part of our in-group, and cold towards people who are not like us or are in our out-group. And it's this process of categorisation that drives our behaviour. Now, I've always been a staunch feminist and I've had a career. Yet when I took an implicit bias test, it suggested that I was biased against working women. Well, how can that be? They're my in-group after all. The confusion arises because our in-group is not just people who look like us, but also is the people who we see have high status. And despite our beliefs, if every time you come to work, every time you switch on the telly or you listen to the radio, men are associated with high status leadership and competency. That is what our unconscious brain is going to learn. It can be helpful to think of our unconscious brains as our mammalian or our reptilian brain. They're not reasoning things out in words. They're learning what things are associated together. And when two events are associated together, our brain actually lays down neurons to connect them. And if our social territory is think leader, think male, then that's what's going to get reinforced in our unconscious mind despite our dearly held beliefs to the contrary. And that's how implicit bias is formed too, says Professor Mazarin Banaji, chair of the Department of Psychology at Harvard. Implicit bias comes from our social world, from our culture, because the content of what the brain knows is what it sees in the world. So I see that men do certain kinds of work and women do other kinds of work. If I had seen in my world that women were largely construction workers and engineers, that's what my brain would have learned. And if I had seen in my world that men largely took care of children at home and cooked and cleaned for them, then that's what my brain would have learned. So the content is absolutely socially given, but the process by which thinking happens that leads to implicit bias, is something that is a part of our evolutionary history. And it's because it goes back so far in our evolution that this process has now slipped from our awareness, says Tinu Cornish. The challenge is that because it's being largely driven by the unconscious, then we may not literally realise what is actually guiding how we respond and how we behave in social situations. So we could actually think that we are incredibly unbiased and liberal in our conscious minds, but end up being biased in our unconscious minds. Exactly. And I think this is a real challenge for many people because we all think that discrimination or bias is something that bad people with nasty values do. And I became interested in unconscious bias when I was carrying out an evaluation of training with a social services team. They were the nicest, most caring, most politically correct bunch of people I had ever met. And yet bias was happening within their organisation. They were in good company. It was the single most important and transformative day of my life when I came face to face with my own bias. Mazarin Banaji of Harvard again. Actually coming face to face with the fact that my mind and my hands were unable to associate female with leadership as well as male with leadership. When I come face to face with the fact that I cannot associate dark-skinned people with good as quickly as I can associate light-skinned people's faces with good things, that's very different from just awareness. That's like somebody putting a little dagger (laughs) into me and turning it a little bit and asking me to sit up and take notice. She's talking about the implicit association test that she, with some colleagues, developed. It's the one that suggested I was biased too. 
You can hear a whole programme about the test on the Analysis website or podcast. Now, there are other versions of the test to identify racial bias, but this one asks you to associate male and female words with words connected with work and home. Most people find it easier to associate men with careers and women with family. We call it the gender career test, and we look at the difference in time it takes to do this and the number of mistakes you make as you're doing this on a computer, of course. And that number, that difference, is a meaningful one because it says that the thumbprint of the culture has been left on my brain, that I carry around in my head what I see in my world, above and beyond my own personal experience. What do the figures actually show when you're comparing oh, men yes. and women? Right. So the figures show that something like 75% of men and 80% of women show this bias. Wow. So women actually more than men. A little bit more, I would say, statistically roughly the same, but if anything, a tad bit more. And I think that what might slow them down is the difficulty of associating male and home. <laughs> so these associations and biases are thought to have been pretty much mapped onto our brains from childhood. Here's Dr Lily Jampol of Humu, a company that aims to make us happier at work. We have neurons and neurons have connections. So they have dendrites and the connections are formed with other neurons when we have an experience doing something and we're learning what that experience means. Stereotypes work in a very similar way. However, stereotypes are not necessarily based in our own experience. They can be based in either the experience of others and the way that that's communicated to us, or just through media and through culture. Neural connections also help the unconscious brain to make quick associations without having to engage the conscious brain. These are called heuristics. These are cognitive shortcuts that our brain takes essentially to help us navigate the world without having to attend to everything in the world at once. So we use heuristics to categorize things. So we're social animals. We tend to categorize things based on fear, based on things that are going to kill us. It's all about survival. Our brain is constantly trying to protect us from things that could threaten us. And so to do that, basically, we create these very quick ways of assessing our environment and deciding whether or not they are threatening. We did this way, way, way back, and we're able to very quickly assess by things like facial characteristics whether or not someone is a threat. Now our brain takes these shortcuts, but they aren't necessarily accurate or based, again, in actual experiences or a real threat. One type is called the representative heuristic. So here's an experiment. I'd like you to imagine a hijacker who's burst into a plane's cabin and is holding a gun to the head of the pilot. So just picture the scene. Now, here's the question. In your picture, is the pilot male? If so, your brain used the representative heuristic of automatically linking the concept of pilot with that of man. And I'm guessing he was probably white too. Now, there's a well-known riddle about this sort of heuristic. I'll let Mazarin Banaji tell it. A father and a son are in a car accident. The father dies. The son is taken to a hospital. The attending surgeon says, I can't operate on this boy. He's my son. You ask people, how is this possible? And people like me go through enormously creative, incorrect paths to come up with answers like the one I did, which is that the father who died was the adoptive father and the father who was the surgeon could have been the biological father, when a very simple answer is staring me in the face that I am incapable of getting to, which is that the surgeon is the boy's mother. <laughs> These days, of course, there is a second correct answer, which is that this is two dads. It's a, it's a gay couple. And people are just as likely to give you that answer as mother, even though the likelihood of gay parents is so much lower than that of a woman who is a surgeon. Now, to me, what is interesting is that personal experience seems not to matter here. I have had a number of people say to me, I was really shocked because things like my mother 
was a surgeon and I couldn't come up with the right answer. That to me is a great example of the power of the culture, that it can set aside your own deep personal experience. And that is an important idea for us to take forward if we want to think about change, that your mother being a surgeon is not going to protect you from gender bias, but what you see in the world is what's driving that. So I'm hitting the road to earn your vote because it's your time. And I hope you'll join me on this journey. If it's that hard to get our heads around the idea of a female surgeon, then perhaps it's not surprising that not enough Americans, even women, were able to get their heads around the idea of a female president, irrespective of who the woman was. My name is Caroline Heldman. I'm a professor of politics at Occidental College, looking at systems of power, so race, class, and gender uh, in the U.S. political context, with a particular emphasis on the American presidency. Part of our cultural DNA is this idea that men are supposed to be in charge. And so when women seek power, both men and women alike tend to have an averse reaction to that. We tend to really dislike and, or in some instances hate power-seeking women. And it affects men more than it affects women in terms of the hatred. But because it's a cultural norm, both men and women alike hold this bias against power-seeking women. There's an implicit bias on the part of about a third of American women, a majority of those being white women, against women who seek positions of power. So we accept the bias is there, even in liberal women. But if we're not aware of it in our conscious brains, is there anything we can do about it? Lots of organisations now use unconscious bias training, like that offered by Professor Bina Candola of business psychologist firm Pern Candola. I went along to try it out. We're looking at a slide here which shows a checkerboard, like a drafts board, and it's got a little cylinder on it which is casting a shadow. And there are two squares there. There's a black square marked A and a white square marked B. Now, what do I have to do? So your task is to tell me which of those two squares is darker, A or B. Well, obviously A is darker because it's a black square. Yeah, it's obvious. Yeah, clearly. It's, clear, it's clearly darker. Actually, they are the same colour. No. They're not. Well... You can see, there they are. The colours never changes. That is quite extraordinary. They are, the, they are the same colour, but yeah. my brain is telling me that one is black and one is white, but just in the shadow, so it's sort of become grey. There are two things going on here. Uh, first of all, it's pattern recognition. And so it's, it's dark, white, dark, white. So there's a pattern. So we, we recognise the pattern and that influences us. And it's also about our experience. And our experience tells us when something casts a shadow, it makes something darker. It's dark if it's in shadow than if it's not in, in shadow. And both of those things about pattern recognition and then our experience drive us to see something that is not there. All right. And in employment situations, for example, at work, you can see these things happening all of the time. Interviewers will make up their mind, untrained interviewers make up their minds about a candidate within fractions of a second. Right. And it'll be based on their appearance, their gender, uh, their height, the way they dress, their accent, they can all... Professor Candola's sessions bring home to us how our brains have been conditioned to react to our environment in a certain way, even flying in the face of evidence. In other words, how we use heuristics to make stereotypical assumptions about gender. These courses can be very useful, but they don't always work, particularly if employees are forced to go on them. They can actually make people more mutinous and therefore more biased. And even with the best intention people, they're not enough on their own, says Harvard professor Mazarin Banaji. If I were to give you a lecture on fat and sugar and how our body converts that into energy, at the end of a three-hour training program on that, will you have lost any weight? And so I use this to argue that, of course, education about our minds, education about where bias may be coming from, all of that is a necessary step if we want to see change. But it is by no means a sufficient step. And we should stop deluding ourselves that when we do, 
unconscious bias training or implicit bias training that we are actually changing the workplace. So what else can we do? Everyone I spoke to had suggestions. Occupational psychologist Tinu Cornish. I challenge the organisations I work with that I am sure they can find 52 role models that then can be a screensaver. They can be past staff, they can be current staff, they can be in allied organisations. But that will mean that once a week, everyone in the organisation is exposed to a positive female role model. Social media analyst Adam Parker. How often does one look back at one's retweets and say, have I been balanced in my approach? You just do it in the moment, don't you? So therefore, it does require people to really think about these things and look at who they're following, look at who they're retweeting and think, is there something I could do to maybe try and redress this balance a bit? Harvard psychologist Mazarin Banaji. How do I sit in a meeting and decide who is deserving of the promotion? I believe that if we're aware of our bias and make it something that we become aware of in the moment. I've been talking a lot about these in the moment awareness raising strategies. For example, in the United States, we know that there is a vast difference in the level of painkillers that are being given to black and white Americans for reporting the same level of pain. I would think that doctors, as soon as they type in a prescription medication into their computer, that a little graph should pop up on the screen, simply showing the doctor the difference in the milligrams that is being given to black and white patients in that hospital system. You do not tell the doctor, the expert, what to prescribe. You do not tell them how they should do their job, but you make them aware that the hospital system has that bias. And you don't just do that by telling them that once a year in a training session. You do that by alerting them to that information in the moment of decision-making. That's smart. And lastly, business psychologist Bina Candola, with his wife, has designed a phone app which helps people challenge the stereotypes they hold about men and women at work. It takes five minutes a day, you can do it on your mobile. It's as easy as we can make it. And you have to do it for three weeks or so. And we had an organisation say to us, we can't imagine our senior leaders doing this. They wouldn't do it. And we thought, well, actually this is really easy. It's five minutes a day. If they can't give up five minutes a day, it's nothing to do with ability. It's actually to do with their motivation. Basically what they're saying is, we could change, but we can't be bothered. And there's the rub. We have to want to. We really should be bothered, women as well as men. Sexism is as vile as racism, and it shouldn't have a place in modern society. So next time you assume that a woman isn't competent until she proves otherwise, just slap yourself on the wrist. Realise that it's your reptilian brain talking and make a conscious decision to act like a 21st century person, not a caveman or woman. Analysis was presented by Marianne Seacart and produced by Arlene Gregorius. I do recommend that episode all about the implicit bias test. You can find it on our podcast feed. And we'd be really grateful if you gave us a rating or a review wherever you get your podcasts, especially a nice one. Next week, Naomi Grimley looks at a big headache facing the European Union. And no, it's not Brexit. It's the challenge to the EU's self-declared values from Poland and Hungary. Don't touch that dial.